de pain Un jardin dans un coin Qui pour eux ne valait rien Quoi une nuit de trois lapins Moutarde J'avais beaucoup plus qu'un lopin Un jardin dans un coin Qui pour eux ne valait rien De quoi une de trois lapins Moutarde Yeah, you are listening to Being There on CIUT 89.5 FM. My name is Jessica Mendez. Welcome to the show, everybody. Today's uh, segment, dedicated to the Russian style of martial arts that dates back to the 10th century, in fact. It's referred to as the system, and it's often described as a training that will help the body think. I love that. Developing your sixth sense opening up your peripheral vision. I love the concept behind this training. I know uh, the person I'm going to interview today for, for have known for years now, and uh, I, I think what speaks to me the most is that it focuses on instinct over technique. It's a, a sort of about breaking up habitual uh, response to hazard by moving into a place where our bodies can actually sort of detect danger or, you know, pick up different signals in our environment that we would otherwise uh, be oblivious to. Emmanuel Manolo Kakis is the owner of the Fight Club. It's a martial arts club in Toronto with programs designed to give you the substance of elite military training without the stress associated with it. Now, Emmanuel has uh, over 20 years uh, training in various martial arts, including many years in sports like wrestling, boxing, and uh, rugby, to name a few. His students include uh, soldiers, cops, security men, anyone looking uh, to be able to protect themselves in a street fight, but that includes, uh, you know, everyday people. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in physical education and sociology from York University, and he's a very uh, interesting interview. I'm thrilled to have him back on the show today. So once again, my name is Jessica Mendez, and I'm here with uh, Manuel Manolo Kakas. Welcome back to the show. It's been a while. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Yeah. How long has it been? It's probably uh, been about four years. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been quite a few years. Mm-hmm. You haven't aged a bit. <laughs> it's all the training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I love your concept. Of course, I sat on, on uh, you know, I visited your studio once, and sat in and sort of watched everybody was just so relaxed it was hard to believe that it was a martial arts uh, class <laughs> this is a very 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 different than any other kind of martial arts out there and i just th th as you know i love the concepts behind it i think they're really sort of cutting edge and original and they just make sense on so many levels i, I think when we focus on technique with something you know and there's just overwhelming focus on 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 technique you just um, okay, let me just because I want to pair. I want to contextualize this interview. I am. I have to admit to something. I am <laughs> a hopeless fan of Dancing with the Stars, mm -hmm. and you know why I love that show is I love watching how someone with apparently no grasp on technique can do so beautifully when they get out on the and with no dance experience and they get out on that dance floor like people who you know one woman they had on she was deaf, mm -hmm. so she was moving to the vibration of the music. Of course. You know, there's something, there's an innate uh, intelligence in the body that if, if we tap into it, it's a very powerful thing. And now this is the concept that your club is built on. That's what we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. But why don't we start with a little bit of history? Sure. Where it came from. So, well, the Sistema, uh, like you, did, you gave in the intro, is about, it dates back 10,000 years. It, it's quite old. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and try to re-bring up the history, but it is old. I've seen it. And... Uh, the people that have taught me um, are active, um, you know, in the military. They've trained people. And, you know, meeting them and seeing what great people they are and how incredible their uh, skills are on so many levels. It's not just fighting level. It's a human ability, just period. Um, you know, uh, you know, PhDs in human survival in extreme conditions. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. you know, imagine spending five days with people like this. It's like extreme conditions, cold, heat, and the same way you handle uh, these situations, hunger, um, uh, pain, or uncomfort, 
you know, over a long period of time is really how you'll approach martial arts. You know, you got to kind of come to terms with it, so to speak. Um, okay. So it, it's quite interesting. You know, their their approach, um, I kind of compare Sistema to um, not a program, if I had to make it a, a kind of a, a modern day uh, um, example. It's more of a really uh, amazing operating system. Uh, you can plug in a lot of programs and it works really well. And that's why it's called the system. It's a system of learning and understanding something. So you could use the same thing to study music uh, as you do this martial arts system. It's uh, it's all based on the same premise. Can you give an example? You sure. Apply so the same two knowledge. years ago, yeah. So mm. I'll give you a, just a quick. Uh, when I was in uh, public school, and uh, we uh, instilled a music program, mm -hmm. so they had thirty instruments, but there was forty kids. <laughs> so obviously, some kids aren't going to get an instrument. I was one of the kids that didn't get an instrument, <laughs> and so. For me, I was never musically inclined. I just never had it. I never had it at a talent level. But as I uh, grew up and as of two years ago, I wanted to um, kind of bring music to my daughter. She's about eight years old. And I said, you know, I, I think it would be a good thing for her to have some music. So I went out, bought a couple of guitars and figured, you know what, we'll do this together. And uh, I realized how incredibly hard uh, an instrument is, like a guitar. And I'm a proficient teacher. So I figured, okay, you know, we'll I'll take some lessons and we'll figure this out. And it's it was incredibly difficult. And the same way I approached martial arts is the same way I approached the instrument. If you, uh, on the surface, it looks like you would hold a guitar um, quite firm. Mm -hmm. But when you see people play guitar, they're holding it very light. And um, the um, fingers are so close together to the strings that there's no way, uh, there's no wiggle room for error. you got to place them precisely otherwise it won't sound right mm -hmm. and then the coordination between the left and right hand yeah <laughs> so yeah. uh it's very similar to when somebody comes at you in in a in an attacking position you have to know where your hands go properly mm -hmm. and then at some point you hold the instrument but you don't think about it right you just play it you got to just play the thing you can't think about it too much you gotta you need time to uh focus on the song on the rhythm on mm -hmm. those kind of things mm -hmm. fingers just got to know where they're going yeah. If you start thinking about it, like, you're not going to play a song. You're just going to go through it uh, as a as a mash. So martial arts is the same thing. You can't think about where to place your hands or what you're going to do. You have to be geared, attune yourself to survival, which is keeping yourself safe all the time, and then letting the hands go where they need to go to solve the problem at hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so at some point, you do have to let go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So so that's, that. I think, segues us into... Uh, this uh, sort of idea of uh, developing natural reflexes. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, in terms of the history, by the way, I was just referring to sort of really bringing emphasis to the fact that this comes from the Russian elite yeah, so military forces. Yeah, this so is a powerful Of course. My, so my instructor, system. Uh, my instructor had once, I guess, communism fell in Russia, which would be the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, a handful of people started to leave, and my instructor was one of them, and he made his way to Toronto. And I found him literally six months or so after he came yeah. and uh, started training there. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I, I did when I passed through the studio was amazed at just how uh, uh, relaxed he was. He wasn't mm -hmm. walking around as an icon. Uh, he was very approachable. And, you know, his words were, yeah, just calm, attack me somehow. <laughs> and that was it. He didn't tell me how to do it. He just said, just grab or punch or kick somehow and we'll start training. <laughs> and, All right. And it was, it, now, I look back, now and you say wow that's so bizarre because everything was very uh choreographed or organized in other martial arts it was like okay we're gonna kick and it's like this and they, they first they calibrate that and then you do it uh whereas here it was totally opposite he goes no everyone punches and kicks and grabs different and you need to understand that and come to terms with it <laughs> and, and the first hand so you learn things in sistema from the first hand meaning uh from a, a very practical perspective you see it all the time nobody tells you know i might say to the students okay you know somebody starts to punch somebody and you know the person that's being punched you know it's better to move i think and but you let me know how it goes for you <laughs> and the first time somebody hits you 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 figure to yourself yeah it's probably better to move <laughs> right so it's really practical mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. teaches you like right away like that you need to always keep yourself safe 
th this is a, an incredible concept. You can't rely on other people for your safety. You have to keep yourself safe. Okay, so what does it mean? It, 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 uh, uh, your system is based on developing these what you call natural reflexes and instincts. So what what does that mean? What well, give me an example of so, a, a natural? So uh, we, we got to go regress a little bit. So okay. there's there's in martial arts or in general there's technical proficiencies or competitive skills. So you see martial arts developing skills that are related to competition. But in real let's say street fighting, it's more survival based. So in other words, it's a winning becomes subjective. Um, meaning uh, survival is not. Your safety as a person is the most important thing. So there's many different ways. Somebody can study avoiding trouble completely, realizing his surroundings and um, not going through bad areas and not being with bad people and not hanging out in bad places and learns how to survive in this world quite nicely and never get into any fights. And that's great. You know, that's one level of survival. Other people put themselves in situations that maybe are more dangerous but maybe they have to for whatever reason they have to cross through a bad part of town or they have to do some sort of job that it requires them to be somehow like this so survival means keeping yourself safe all mm -hmm. the time so mm -hmm. i see people in downtown toronto all the time waiting to cross the road and they'll be literally a foot away from the sidewalk a foot away from the road from the sidewalk on a snowy day with lots of snow, slippery conditions on the road, and they're so close to the road where the cars are. To me, you've put yourself in danger for no apparent reason. You could take mm -hmm. three steps back and mm -hmm. be a hell of a lot safer. Mm -hmm. It's stuff like that. It's a, it's mm -hmm. safety is everything. It's just mm -hmm. where you place yourself in this world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a fight. Mm -hmm. It can be that situation. Okay. So th there's one. Safety is always yours. In other words, whether you decide to climb up a ladder to go clean the leaves in your in your mm -hmm. thing and, and realize that the footing is not uh, solid, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's safety. But how does this tie into that? We started with natural instincts well, or natural reflexes, sorry. The natural reflexes, when you're talking about uh, when you have to think, they're mm -hmm. not natural, right? So th uh, okay. I'll give you a different example. Here's, you know, the, the little the little deer going for a drink of water at the pond. And, of course, the lion's mm -hmm. waiting in the bushes, mm -hmm. right? He can't see... Th the lion. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, boom, the lion pops out and the natural reflexes give it the hop that it needs to maybe get away. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. So that's survival. The lion didn't walk up to the, the, the little uh, deer and say, I'm coming. <laughs> he snuck up. Mm -hmm. He surprised it. That's survival. The people on the street, nobody, it's not like Hollywood. The person comes up to you and says, I'm coming for you. It's very rare. They usually sneak around somehow and try to surprise you somehow, even with their words or their gesture. In, in a, potential fights, attacker, yeah, a potential attacker, you mean? A potential attacker. It's see. quite common. In, in all my years when I worked the door at a bar, mm -hmm. it was always usually somebody, uh, a sucker punch somebody or jump somebody from the side when they weren't ready. Mm -hmm. Even people who look like they can handle themselves mm -hmm. still chose the way uh, from the, uh, the side. And when you ask people that are quite powerful and dominant person why would you sneak up on this person they they also don't want to be embarrassed they don't want to uh, maybe take the chance of losing as well they also have worries in themselves right seriously uh, no, no i'm sorry are you talking about a potential attacker yeah that, of oh. course he's a potential attacker also doesn't want to it realizes he he has a chance of losing somehow or somehow being defeated so he always tries to take the sneaky way okay always okay they and you're saying go. that's not a good idea no, it's a, well, if you're going to fight, no, <laughs> you should. So we're going kind of in different ways now. So if somebody wants to attack you. Well, okay, I just want to be able to follow you. It's yeah. not a, It's not like Hollywood stuff. The person mm -hmm. comes to, hey, you. Mm -hmm. It's not like this. It's really mm -hmm. rare. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to harm you, they usually come more covert. Mm -hmm. They usually hide their intentions more. Mm -hmm. They try to get close to you to uh, uh, get past your um, defensive barriers. Right, we have natural defensive barriers. So, in other words, uh, you can sense, like you talked about, the sixth sense of of sensing danger. Right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. danger. W whenever uh, police uh, come to a crime scene mm -hmm. and they start asking their questions uh, mm -hmm. to the victim of what happened, it becomes painfully clear to the victim that actually all the signs were there of danger, but they didn't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. They're not paying attention to it. The signs are all there. But how do you pay attention to it? You have to be aware of yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to look and just ask yourself some questions. Look around. Why is that person wearing a trench coat in the summertime? You know, like simple questions like this. Why is this person standing so close to me for no apparent reason when there's lots of room 
everywhere else. Like when somebody's up to something, they have certain mannerisms or certain tension in the body. Mm-hmm. If I want to come up to you and steal your wallet, uh, you know, as I get closer, that idea burdens me. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it radiates as a tension. It's a vibration through the air. And you can you can sense it. It's a radio station, just like you, you tune in, uh, mm-hmm. your listeners are tuning in now. You tune in, once you tune into it, you realize, wow, there's, it's really hard for somebody to sneak up on you. Another example, poker players. Look at how subtle their movements are when they're trying to bluff. Mm-hmm. They try to hide them. They try to relax themselves. They keep everything as normal as possible. But anybody watching the poker knows that they're up to something, they, even though they're trying to act like they're not up to something. Well, the thing that really irks me is, you know, I'm constantly looking around at people on on streetcars and subways and whatnot, and they're just absolutely buried in their <coughs> headphones or their iPod or whatever it is. And I think that that's scary to me. Like, I, I just you, you become so disconnected from your environment, whether you you know whether you've got the headphones on or you know you can't hear, like you can't sort of feel sort of shifts of energy around you. You can't hear unusual sounds. You it's, can't. It's really simple when you're if and I know. Listen, iPods and, 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 and communication devices are part of our life. We can't mm-hmm. get rid of them. It's, it's easy. I hear lots of people say, put this down, and, and I'm a little bit more moderate. I, I look at these things as, as something we need to have in this modern day. People are using it. All you have to do is just once in a while, mm-hmm. look up. <laughs> well, yeah, just, that's the point. Just, yeah. just know <laughs> once in a while. Look yeah. up and, and, do, and just look around at the people that are close to you. Yeah. And ask yourself, are there, you know, you can Unsavory tell. Unsavory characters. Yeah, like, it's not even a look. Just mm-hmm. ask yourself how you feel. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Just ask how how, how the people around make you feel. Yeah. If you have a bad feeling, that's already you have a choice to make. Either mm-hmm. you move or you put up with a consequence. If, it, it's, if it's possible, mm-hmm. that's it. But ask yourself how you feel, not what it looks like. I know some people obviously look like they're trouble. That's already falls into a different category. Okay. Mm-hmm. But ask yourself how you feel. Some people, you know, maybe look quite scary, but they feel no problem. They have uh, their <laughs> yeah, own yeah. their own things on yeah. their mind, you know. You know, I was on the subway coming mm-hmm. down, and uh, you know, I'm uh, you know my mid forties now, and I saw some young kids. Clearly, they 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 looking for trouble, but I don't fall into their age category, so I'm not. Uh, we have nothing together with each other. You know, they're on a different frequency. They're <laughs> looking, they're looking for kids their yeah. age to have trouble with, not really right. me, right? They yeah. see me as the old guy over there. Just you know, he's <laughs> he's got to go do a radio show, so <laughs> we'll leave him alone. No, I I didn't register on their frequency. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Um, that's really what it is, you know. Like, try to mm-hmm. think of it: a predator, mm-hmm. a lion, a tiger, anything. You you have to register as prey on their on their frequency. Mm-hmm. I didn't for them, you know. Mm-hmm. So look up once in a while, and th- I've done it many a times. I feel bad. I feel um, I don't feel good about where I am. I'll pl- move and go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I I can't tell you uh, just as many times I've been on the subway. I will see somebody, uh, a woman or a guy sitting beside somebody who's visibly trouble and feeling and look in all possible and the person will come onto the streetcar or onto the bus or onto the subway and sit right beside that person and it's like wow you have put yourself into danger you have put yourself into real danger Mm -hmm. you know and it's really hard for me to sit there and, and watch that because it's so visible and the feeling is so vibrant that you're like i wouldn't sit there if the guy said here's 200 bucks i wouldn't sit there you know, it's just, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not worth it. I've been on elevators where somebody's come in that just gave me a very, very bad feeling and I've walked out of the elevator the next stop. Yeah. I don't, I, I, th- because it's not that I'm, I'm scared. It's that I realized that part of my martial art training is to also uh, control those situations. You don't want to be engaged in those things, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. You don't. It's it's not necessary. Maybe as a young punk, you can say, yeah, yeah, okay, I want to look for trouble. But as you grow older and you have responsibilities, you realize that's not very responsible to your family and the people that you love around you to put yourself in harm's way mm-hmm. for, for no reason. You know, so what I show at the club and whatever, what, uh, let's say, Sistema teaches people is like, what will you fight for? You know, your family, your country, mm-hmm. um, friends, people that you need to protect. Ask yourself those questions. And when the moments before uh, trouble happens, say, is this really worth fighting for for me? If not, leave it. It's Mm -hmm. not worth it. Don't engage and put yourself into harm's way. 
Yeah. Well, back to this whole sort of, you know, connecting with your environment thing. I mean, I, I agree with you on, on moderation, uh, by the way, but I, I, I guess I was mostly referring to people who just become so immersed that they literally forget to look up, you know, or they just, they're, they're not doing that sort of periodic check-in and you can stand right in front of them and say, you know, I was, I was on a streetcar once and the driver said, you know, okay, we're short turning. Everybody's got to get off. Sorry. Last minute, you know, and everybody got off and there was somebody sitting there and their little iPad. They were so oblivious that they didn't see the entire streetcar get off and standing on the streetcar staring at him (laughs) waiting for him to you know clue in so and I see that kind of thing all the time it's just really scary how disconnected people are becoming that's one level so that's the martial art way that way meaning they're 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 taking away their number one um, defensive mechanism looking and seeing yeah Mm. so that's already a big problem it's so basic it's it's already a big problem Um, and they're not listening to it at all unfortunately until there's a problem and then they'll be listening to it so life has a way of ironing this stuff out for everybody right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um the first time it happens then you'll make the changes now uh, a lot of um the concept behind this and and i i don't know um if i ever mentioned there's a book uh that i read i think it was around the time that i that I uh, met you, uh, I can't remember the title, of course, damn it, but <laughs> it has something to do with, you know, uh, you know, w- when somebody's, wa- you know, all of us, uh, most of us may know what it feels like to feel as if somebody's staring at you and mm-hmm. you kind of turn around and you, you know, it's just like you, you, that, that eyes on the back of your head, but it's not quite, you know, you don't yep. really know that sensation, that awareness, that whatever you want to call it, sixth sense, wh- you teach, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, this idea that the more you pay attention to it, the stronger it gets. Oh yeah, you because can it's very weak it. at first. The, well, it can it's weak. Be. It's weak because of where we live, like in the city. It's mm-hmm. weak because of that. Because uh, we don't. Um, the city life kind of makes people go into themselves a little bit. They don't. They haven't. Don't have a chance to relax. The city life kind of is like a big heavy coat on you. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's hard to once you get out into, let's like, say, a country. Mm-hmm it feels like it comes off it's not just that it's true it feels like this um the sixth sense when you relax okay when you when you let go inside when i mean um i don't know if you've often heard of this people that want to train in perfection the whole train con- in perfection yeah so the, you want to be perfect in something okay it doesn't matter what it is we'll, we'll use an example of um because we're talking about the hunger games and All i was telling right. you how much i like the bow and arrow right so you talk bow and arrow so first you pull you grab a bow and arrow and you pull it back and of course physically you have to let go so the arrow can go to the target but then you realize you start to work with the technical aspects holding it steady pulling it back harder uh, lightly holding the fingers and you realize your chances of a bullseye become 50 50 or whatever over time but then when you um when you actually pull back the arrow and really relax yourself and uh meaning of your worries and your doubts about where the arrow will go and you just relax and hold hold it steady and let it go your chances of bull, bullseye increase tremendously so perfection really? perfection when you talk to people that are, are talking about you know gymnastics who need to perform a perfect routine for a gold medal you talk about the from these experts about how to attain that and the whole concept of a perfection in something they usually say they can windle it down to one thing letting go that's it when you let go and you relax you'll be perfect that's it but it's letting go is the hardest thing look at vacation people go vacation three four days and then finally at three day they feel oh, they sit in the they the, take a breath they yeah. take a breath and they, they sink in the, the sand better like oh they're floating in the water oh this is it they see it took some time it, they thought they were relaxed oh yeah I'm relaxed and then boom and then it just it's like one inch drop it's a big one you're holding a lot of um, tension or uptightness inside your body mm-hmm. and you cannot deny this because you see all the prescription medication for tension and hypertension and uh, stomach ailments. This is all from upset. You know what? What's the old that is? Don't get your don't get your uh, intestines in or not. That's tension goes inside you, and it takes a while for you to relax this stuff. Mm-hmm. These are muscles that are out of your control. They're unconscious muscles. They work with your psyche more. So sorry, you went into that to to talk about that's an integral part of developing that. That yeah, sense? of oh. course. If you relax, you can feel mm-hmm. it. Oh, I see. You, Sorry, you, I you can't yeah. feel when you're when you're tense. You can't feel anything when you're tense. When you relax, you can feel everything. 
You can see joy in the person. You can see sadness. You meet the friend and you can even say, hey, you got a promotion. Then you look really happy. That's a different happy in you. They go, yeah, I just did. I got into college. I got into this. You can see it. And uh, we did some training up north about uh, with my instructor. And it was about uh, 80 or so guys at the time, maybe 100 years ago. And so we had five. You got in groups of five. And one person was in the middle. And the four other people made a, a cross, so they were like a square around you, mm-hmm. okay, a big square around you, maybe 20 meters away. So it was quite a good distance away. Mm-hmm. It was quiet. We were out in open fields. And the only thing my instructor asked is the person in the middle, close your ears with your fingers, close your eyes, and um, one of the four people is going to start to walk towards you. And what I want you to do is just point to where you feel that, that, that wh- whoever, whichever person you think is walking towards you, point to that way when you get a feeling. Okay. Not when you have a thought, when you get a feeling. First hour, the uh, the ratio is probably like uh, 40% people got it. But mm-hmm. they were guessing. Mm-hmm. It was. It was just they were guessing. That's normal. That's how we yeah. cheat as people, right? We have a we have this normal thing. We we learned this from public school how to cheat correctly. So we we kind of said, okay, the teacher is just going to do this for an hour. So let's just cheat our way through it. When we realized that this was going to be the training for the day, and with various partners, it was going to be this subtle because we were all, we, we didn't quite know what the training would be. Then we relaxed and we actually lent ourselves to that training and said okay it's going to be like this let's let's actually try it i mean what the hell i already i already did my uh, pretend for an hour so let's try maybe work <laughs> with what 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 my teachers are asking me to do mm-hmm. and when we did the percentage went up and a few of uh, people not myself personally i got to about 70 percent so which is about seven out of ten times the person was walking i could predict where they were uh, i knew a few of the guys with me had almost a 10 out of 10 and we're it ta- was phenomenal. There was no relying on sound, like did nothing. What about you their plugged your shuffling? ears. You plugged your ears. Your eyes were closed, yeah. and they were twenty meters away. Okay. And there was a wind. You, you, there's no way. I mean, you, I mean okay. maybe you could have, but I, it wasn't like this. I don't think anybody yeah. would be cheating to that degree. And you're just feeling. And people will talk about a heat mm-hmm. or um, uh, some sort of emotion that they would feel on their body on the side of uh, where they felt the person oncoming. Or a sense. Or a sense. And yeah. we did it quite like this. And then to end the training for the last hour, instructors asked us to, the person that was going to walk forward, to put a vivid, uh, uh, aggressive, uh, bad intention in their head. Like just think of spinning their head off or grabbing a knife in your hand and Love plunging like, it in. Yes. <laughs> and, no, but just a very yeah. rich thought. And okay. uh, all of us uh, quite quickly uh, uh, felt the direction even quicker. Because before oh. it was kind of like, it was like, ha, 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 we'll sneak up to the person. So it wasn't so much of a threat. It was more yeah. like kids. But then when we put a bad thought in our head, it became much more clear in stereo and in, in, you know, in, in real sound. It was, it was vivid. And it goes to show you that, I mean, we didn't even have a day of training in this. And I know of Spets units, which are the special forces units, mm-hmm. they're trained specifically for this. Really? Huh. Well, but, but they're used to protect who? Presidents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are people that ca- they don't want trouble to happen. They want it to stop before it's even close. Right. They don't need. They cannot have anything. You know, to a to a, a funnier degree, it's people in Hollywood don't want this. You don't want the paparazzi to have any picture of of, of trouble. You want to see you come out of the car, mm-hmm. pictures, everybody smiling, and that's a perfect day. You yeah. know, they don't need trouble. So there's a whole other group of professionals that work before trouble and a whole group of professionals that work after trouble you know they're called bullet catchers <laughs> yeah yeah you don't want to be one of those you, th- you quickly say i think i'll i think i'll do the preemptive one and in in a funny way this is special forces training but in a funny way i use it as a father i'm always preemptive with my kids i don't want to be in trouble i always want to make sure that they're safe before there's anything i don't want to wait till the person's beside me that realizes trouble you know, there's only one other time I remember um, that impulsive thing happening to me where I was at a park and uh, a dog just went nuts. I don't know what happened. He just started running towards um, uh, me and my kids. And I just, in a moment's notice, had to pick him up off the ground and uh, hold them both in my hand as this mad dog's running towards me. And luckily, at the very end, uh, the owner called the dog back quickly and uh, we avoided any problems. But other than that, I've never remember any dangerous situations being with my kids around I've, you've always managed to be very 
preemptive about it. Yeah. So it depends what you're training for. Yes. But preemptive stuff is excellent if you have a family or kids that you want to protect or loved ones that you want to protect. And uh, it's probably the the number one place people should study martial arts. They study too many times. They study when the problem already happened. Yes. Okay. You know? yeah. And we see what happens even in the health world on that aspect. You know, people wait till they find out they have a problem before they take care of themselves. Just take care of yourself first, and you won't have a problem. I know. I know. It's the nature of uh, yeah. Western medicine, especially. Um, there's another cool exercise you told me about once with the glass, the poison. Can you yeah, talk well, about that? Well, because, again, it's it, a danger, whether it be physical danger or poison. Because, in, again, even in, in Russia, this is quite common. All, in all different worlds, people would poison people. It was the easiest way of getting rid of somebody, right? So when you're attuned um, to uh, the environment, to everything you do, mm-hmm. the food you eat, mm-hmm. the people, the friends that you have around you, the places that you go to hang out. Um, you make sure that they're good places. So often it's it's quite customary, um, let's say in uh, Russian uh, homes, you know, where you sit down to eat, somebody will say a prayer, and then they reflect about the food they're going to eat. They do. They reflect about it just for a second. Even when they have a drink, they don't just drink. The vodka is poured. It's not meant to be drunk. You look at everybody, you say a toast. You never just drink it. You say a toast. And it's it means something. And those moments before you do something, you actually see how you feel about the food, see how you feel about the drink. And some people can swear, they can they can feel when something's just not right. Hmm. And yeah. can that ability be developed? I wouldn't see why not. You know, I mean, this is very intriguing to me because I'm I'm prone to food poisoning very easily. So, and some people are much more prone than others if their immune system is compromised. Of course, you know, if a food is or chicken or whatever has been you, left out too long. But I'm sure you've seen this. You know that Coke challenge, whatever they used to have, the Pepsi yeah, Coke, yeah. and people pick. Oh no no no! This is Pepsi. <laughs> it's like how can you know? Really, I was looking at the thing and I was like, okay, they could taste just a little bit different. Of of the, the the flavor from Pepsi to Coke, I'm thinking, of course you can poison and stuff like this does have a, a certain uh, <laughs> thing, but of course you can do it. But again, we're uh, so displaced in Canada from this. What's yeah. more realistic would be for you to sense bad food, so that before you shove the whole meal in your mouth, mm-hmm. you know the first bite and you can spit it out, so it's not 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 uh, too bad. I believe in this. So how do you do that? You just you just how do you develop that sense of bad food? So how do you first, it's not it's when you say develop that sense, not just bad food of everything. First, yeah, 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 okay. it's the same as that uh, that person you said on the bus who's got their head down. They're just not aware. Okay. So first thing, be aware. Have a look at the food you're gonna eat. Okay. Have a look at it. how does it look? Looks All good. Right. Great. Have a smell. Take a small piece first. Put it in your mouth. Chew it well, which is really what you're supposed to do with food. But so, which and exactly? Take a second, but and take a second. But sometimes you get food poisoning from something that looks and yes, yes. smells there's nothing, good. There's nothing that's 100. percent I know. No, no, no. I'm wondering, is there something those, else you can do? Those are the steps. You know, there's I mean, a intu- couple I mean, of things. Do sort of intuition. What we're do you ta- do? We're talking about this. I'll tell this to your listeners. Okay. All right. Do it. Don't just do things for one thing. Do it with everything you do in your life. Take a second. Mm-hmm. Look up ask yourself look around you and look at the world mm-hmm. a little bit colorful when you eat do the same thing just take a second and look at it mm-hmm. if your listeners do this already they're mm-hmm. already going to be um uh, incredible i know a person out in barry i'm not going to say his name but i know a person out in barry the first day tim hortons changed their coffee bean mm-hmm. he had a sip of coffee he didn't know he was like he goes something's wrong with this coffee I don't know, mm-hmm. and this you know, and this this guy is as you know seven oh five as it can get. You know, rough and tough guy. You know, he w- at that moment in a, in a matter of two seconds, he turned into like a wine connoisseur. He's like trying to figure this out. Something's wrong here, and I'm thinking I chugged the coffee back. I didn't I didn't sense anything, but he was attuned to his coffee. He loved his coffee, <laughs> and he was attuned to that. They changed their bean. They did. They changed their they changed the bean that they made their coffee with. And I'm telling you, it's a skill, but you just got to take time with it. But is it, what, what is it you're paying to? Because a, a, a fellow, a coinacera actually in, in marijuana was telling me the other day that he experiences the same phenomenon there. You can find weed that looks good and smells great, but it's bad weed. So, I mean, is it a matter of when you're looking at the food, sort of, even if it looks good, is it also a matter of paying attention to how you feel in that case? Is that... So I'll, I'll I'll tell you. So I'll give you as best example as I can. All right. 
when somebody starts something, they first use their head. They start with their head mm -hmm. as they, they think about it. But naturally, as people do things over time, th the head starts to shut off a little bit and you start to feel things more from your heart. So use your feeling. So a musician starts to play their music. A chef starts to cut up the food as according to a recipe. And then after a while, naturally, if they do it for a period of time and they practice it, all of a sudden they feel the right amount. And the old uh, Greek women that would, you know, trying to teach me recipes of how to cook and they never, they just a pinch of this, handful of that. They didn't, they, didn't, they just went by feel and they made some amazing stuff. It's because they did it enough that they felt it in their heart. Mm -hmm. So now, if you, if all the listeners just take their time slowly down this path and they start to feel rather than look and think, because when you're thinking, that's not, that's the already the lowest form of anything. <laughs> right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's it when you feel yeah you'll know that's it that's the high the highest thing. who was it those greek uh great uh, thinkers they said a highest form of highest form of knowing is mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. when you feel it that's it so i, I don't want to it's not some big this zen is, thing no. it is deep you know so if you start to look all a little bit deeper at everything you're doing be aware because for me the first time I started doing this it was brought great sadness it was a very saddening thing because you see very sad things like you see somebody wasting their time you know one hour on top of uh, some little mobile device endlessly and it's kind of sad they're missing the whole world around them I know you know they, and it's like that is sadness when you look at it like that yeah. or you see the person you know at a park uh, playing with some gadget and then their kids over there and they're not paying attention to their kids you're yeah. like wouldn't you, you won't regret that time. So it becomes sad things that you see. So it's difficult. Or you look at the food that you're eating and sometimes it's like, it's quite sad. You're like, really? It doesn't look that good. <laughs> right? like, did I put this in my mouth? It's kind of sad, right? Yeah. When I look up and I look at people and especially when they're eating and uh -huh. walking, it's like, wow, you know, in Europe, that's like, it's like the biggest insult. It's like only horses do that. They say, you know, people <laughs> yeah. sit and enjoy yeah. their food. It's yeah. like you, the yeah. what's food is to be savored, and you're you're reducing food to just just like <laughs> something you you put in your stomach. That's I all know. you've taken. You've you've I demoralized know. the whole value of it. So when you say, yeah. how do you sense bad food? Um, I still remember my aunts coming from Greece and my dad pouring some wine to them, and they picked it up. They had just a very simple sip. And they said, no, this is not very good. And right from the sip. And my dad said, really? And then he had a sip. He goes, I don't know. And he, he was like, well, after a while, I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with it. He goes, no, that's not good. And these are two women, my dad's sisters, that drink nothing but, but the most organic, ridiculously organic mm. wine and the most ridiculously organic olive oil. I mean, they, they get it right from the farm. It's right there. So they know pure. And we, my, even my dad come to realize how even our taste buds are are almost deafened now they're almost uh, numb to what is good like even that it takes a while to when you see it so this thing about poisoning it might be just in the very foods that we eat and almost numb our palates to even detecting it yeah but i dare anybody to go up somewhere in some nice place and eat good food and tell me they can't detect it i don't know i think it's uh, it's a big thing Let's, uh, it, let's, I should jump in here actually, and uh, for anybody tuned in in the last few minutes, my name is Jessica Mendes, and I'm speaking with Emmanuel Manolo Kakis, the owner of the Fight Club. It's a martial arts club uh, in Toronto uh, designed to uh, give people the substance of elite mil military training without the stress associated with it. And uh, part of uh, that training is helping, as they put it, the body think, helping the body to think. Uh, very intriguing uh, concept to me. So let's talk about peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. This isn't one of my favorite topics because this is something I think about, like the other things I've mentioned today, a lot. I can't stand wearing sunglasses because of what it does to my vision. I mm. can't stand even wearing regular glasses. I stubbornly avoid them even when my vision gets blurry and I'm sitting at late night in front of my computer because I'm determined to keep my vision strong. And so far, I've actually done really well with this strategy. Um, but there's just, I, my peripheral vision has always been extremely important to me. And yet it's, I, I've noticed that a lot of people actually somehow don't 
have it or don't, or, or, or rather it's just not developed, however you might put it. What's your approach to developing that and why is that important? Okay, so uh, let's go back a little bit further yeah. as to its the, the importance of peripheral vision. To survival, peripheral vision is everything. In other words, um, if you're an animal and you're walking down the path in the forest, the threat never came in front. It always came from the sides or from the back. So your back covered by intuition work and the sides were picked up on the peripheral of your vision. Now, you got to make this clear. The peripheral vision is much better than the dead center of your eye. And you know, when you're looking for something, people say, I can't find it. And then all of a sudden you look and then out of the corner of your eye, you find it. There was some training I did um, uh, six years ago. Six, yeah, six years ago. We had to go down a one quarter kilometer uh, path in the dark. And there was going to be 10 people waiting in ambush. And the only thing we had to do is when we felt the ambush, we had to just ra- raise our hands up. And that was it. The ambush was over. So if we detected it, it was over. And the first couple of times we're looking in, we're looking deep into the forest trying to find where uh, the people were hiding. But people can uh, hide so well, camouflage themselves so well that it was impossible to detect by looking. So we were always ambushed. And then uh, a group of professional uh, guys went through and they found us every time. And uh, which is very customary in Russia, they, they sit down and everybody talks about what they learned. And uh, we struggled with it. And they said, you should try it again and look down the path, which is where your eyes should always be because you want to walk and not fall into a hole or hurt yourself. But your attention is on the path, but your focus is on your peripheral vision. And I'm like, so you, fo- your attention is somewhere, but your focus is somewhere else. And that was quite interesting. Attention and focus can be can be different. And I use this with my kids all the time. I focus on what I need to do, but my attention is with the kids. They can be running around, but I'm still shopping. But they're running around, and I can pay attention to what they're doing, but I'm focused on shopping. I see. See, so okay. so when we went yeah. through the forest, then when I was looking dead center at the path, I saw the guy hiding. I could see him. I, I knew he was camouflaged, but he, I could pick up his shape better. It was phenomenal. Uh, it wasn't just me. It was lots of people felt this. It was like such an epiphany moment. It was because we think we don't trust it. We we, we don't uh, trust it enough. Mm-hmm. So we look at it. And that in itself is a flaw of our society. We we have to look at something and we, we believe it is. Mm-hmm. When you don't look at it, you'll see it much clearer than when you're looking at it. It's such an oxymoron, but it's true. Hmm. So peripheral vision. So how do you train with this? So uh, to build up the peripheral vision and also for yourself to know the degree of peripheral vision you have. So a, a nice exercise is you, three people. One person's in the middle just standing straight and looking ahead at a wall. And their attention is on the wall. So they focus the attention on a wall, on a spot on the wall, whatever they like. And then their their focus needs to be on the sides. As the two people are behind them, they're just basically going to walk up alongside them slowly. As soon as they come into vision, you rise your hands. So you, and then they stop and then you look at where they are. And usually your peripheral vision is not 90, it's not 180, it's a little bit back. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, uh, so it's not a direct straight line from the corner of your eye out. It goes actually a little further back. Um, so it's quite interesting. And uh, you would see some people, at first, people were about a foot ahead of their eyes before they detected them. And it that doesn't say you have bad eyesight. That says that you're not able to focus on the sides. I see. Right, you have yeah. a low spectrum of focus. Um, and then it's developed. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, okay, I get it. And, and you develop it. And it's phenomenal what your eyes can pick up on the sides. It's really amazing. Um, but there's so many life examples that could give you that, that uh, you, you need to get information from the sides, you know. I remember uh, stock exchange, you know, watching um, a guy look at the ticker for some stock that's selling. And in one corner of the eye, he has the trader. And on the other side, he has the owner of his company. And he's able to pay attention to both guys on the sides, but keep an eye on that ticker. Yeah. And the moment it flips, he looks to the one, he looks to the other. Like it, It's incredible how big the range is. Do you deal with this a lot? Like when when people come to you, they're new. Uh, you do you deal with people who have just become so fixated on what's in front of them that they're completely cut off from their peripheral vision? What what's the ratio? 
So new, so new people. Um, everyone comes to something for a different way, for a different reason. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very important at the beginning. If let's say uh, you know you were coming to me and I was uh, a guitar teacher, mm-hmm. not a martial art teacher, mm-hmm. and uh, you would come in so excited, you just got an electric guitar, and the first thing I was to tell you is drop, sit you down, and make you play chords. <sighs> you, you you probably wouldn't play the guitar long. Mm-hmm. People come to you with their ideas and their excitement, and it's fine. It's good. That's we all find. We all get interested in something. So the most important thing is to first see what each student is excited about, and go with that. It's it's good. And then all on their own, they're going to say, "Okay, I think I need to work on this more. I think I need to work on that more." And you know, life will just as these things become interesting, they will they'll they'll discover them their own, right? Like it's interesting to you, but I, I very rarely will I find this topic interesting to, uh, let's say, a twenty one year old. But mm-hmm. give him a couple of years of training, and he's saying, "Hey, Manuel, how do you do what you do?" Then I'll start explaining because mm-hmm. he's ready now. So you can't force it. So yeah, this yeah. kind of comes to people, mm-hmm. um, but the first time somebody gets their wallet lifted mm-hmm. and it's quite common in uh when i was in europe it's quite common in spain actually the uh, pickpockets and the first time you get your wallet lifted your peripheral open up <laughs> <You'll be> a, <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah 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 you'll be like you're looking at everybody the first time i saw uh-huh. somebody take my take my wallet like just to, to see i couldn't believe how efficient it was i was like wow i marveled at it i was like mad of course my wallet was gone but i couldn't <laughs> believe somebody huh. could pull it so easily yeah um and then after that, you know, there was a. I was very skeptical of everybody around me. My peripheral vision opened up quite clear, you know. Wow. So this is really what it is, right? Okay, we, we got to switch gears here because there's something I want to. I can't believe how fast this time has gone. We've only got about five minutes left. Six minutes or so It goes too fast. <laughs> There is a subject, as you know, that I wanted to cover today, even if only briefly, because there's this huge, you know, obsession now with the Hunger, Hunger Games, mm-hmm. you know, both the book and the and the movie. And for those who are not, I mean, most people have heard of it by now, but for those who are not familiar, it's basically about this, this based on this futuristic reality show in which young kids, you know, basically are thrown into an arena and fo- forced to kill each other until there's one person left, so-called the winner. <laughs> and this is a reality show that everybody you know, watches and it's a metaphor. I mean, I haven't seen the movie yet, but I imagine it's sort of a metaphor for our obsession with this kind of thing Mm -hmm. uh, on a much smaller scale and sort of profiting from or entertaining ourselves with other people's misery. Uh, You said that there is a mixed, uh, what's called MMA, mixed martial arts Mm -hmm. uh, out there now that's, um, that uh, you didn't quite compare to the gladiator, but had, you know, sort of, it 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 is. No, listen, you go back to Rome and the gladiators, that's what they did. It was a big coliseum, a couple of guys got in the middle, they even threw lions in there, it was, it it got, it got weird, you know, it was basically too Big burly guys will get in there, punch, kick, grab, choke. Somebody did something, and then the emperor was happy. Put his thumb down, put his thumb up. You know, it's nothing new. The Greeks had a uh, pancration, which is um, a mix of wrestling and boxing. So the best boxer met the best uh, wrestler, and they decided who was the tough guy. And this is what mixed martial art is now, right? It's basically um, put into a cage, which is, m- I think, more marketing you know how to distinguish it from let's say boxing ring yes okay. right so it was it, which was clever and then they started to pull from different martial arts and uh, put it in there as an entertainment so this is not just big i mean it's it's massive you this is happening now oh it's been happening for years years it's been growing i i i would assume oh, in maybe 10 years I, I i don't quote me on the exact time but it's been around a while and it is probably if it not, not is the fastest growing sport in all of North America, if not Europe, do they actually kill each other? No, 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 no. no, no. They fight. They, they have the rules and things each like other this. It, listen, as an entertainment, it's wonderful. It's very entertaining. You go to any bar in Toronto; it's very entertaining. Um, you know, so as an entertainment, it's it's wonderful. People, but it's consider- entertaining to for someone with bloodlust. Yes, it can be bloodlust. <laughs> if uh, you're a martial artist, you might take the technical proficiency. You know, it depends. All right. There's. It, there, there's characters, right? The, everybody um, has a personality. You know, when MMA first started, mixed martial arts started, they tried to sell it like uh, this martial art versus that martial art. And then they realized actually that's quite limiting because it wasn't definitive. What is definitive is people. They're characters. 
you know, it sometimes doesn't matter what martial art you study. It's if you apply it properly and you have really tough, good fighting spirit and you're an entertaining person, much like Muhammad Ali, you know, he he's, he revolutionized boxing that way. He was entertaining. He was engaging. You know, he was uh, fun. He was comedic. He was serious. He was political. He, he got in involved. So the characters in MMA now, so it's evolved to more character base. You know, it's more people, you know, it's uh, this person versus that person with these skills and, you know, put them in a cage. And it, it's a reality thing, you know, it's just there, there's definitely, it's real life and people are going at it. Do you think there's in part uh, sort of an intention there to, uh, I mean, the cage conjures up, you know, the, the association, of course, with animals. So do you think uh, that's got to be deliberate? You know, we, you can look at this and cut it many different ways, you know, to uh, how you want to slice and dice this. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, you can look at it in many different ways. A sportsman will see it one way. Mm -hmm. You will see it a different way. Um, older people will see it a different way. Um, younger people see it a different way. You know, at the end of the day, people just have to ask themselves, entertainment. It, it really is entertainment. And they, you know, don't get too caught up in it. At the end of the day, it's what sells tickets. And I remember meeting an old boxer, and he was um, a very nice guy. And he explained to me some stuff about the politics of boxing back in the 1930s and 40s. And he said, Emmanuel, the best boxers in those days, because I quite liked boxing when I was younger, um, he said to me, the best boxers in those days never saw the light of the ring ever. Because back then, um, a, a boxing match, the promoters and the people that owned the bars, they wanted it to go quite long. They wanted the match to go long because people drank a lot, they partied, they celebrated, you know, it was, they made a lot of money off those kind of things. So it was the really good boxers, the people that could literally knock out somebody in the first round, they were just so talented, they could never deploy their skills. Nobody would ever want to set up a match for them. So look at how interesting that is. So you, the, the people that won all these championships actually weren't the best boxers at the time. They were just the ones that could go the, the length of the round and, and follow the flow of the, the contest mm -hmm. so that people mm -hmm. made money. See what I mean? So there is a, a business and marketing side to MMA as well. And people just got to ask themselves some questions about that. Mm -hmm. well, what's, uh, what's our obsession? What's behind? Yeah, like what's behind? Culturally and from business standpoint too. Culturally, why? Why we like it so much? You know, is, what is this? Is it bigger, like, wh where is this kind of thing? It's massive. Uh, in I North America, it's bigger? Canada, some of the best players are, are from Canadians, you know, and even Europe. You go all over, everybody's do. Everybody's having these things. It's, it's got to be the fastest growing sport in North America. It's not Europe. It's really uh, got a huge following. Have you have you been able to make any observations about, uh, you know, what may motivate people in different countries? Uh, I'm assuming there might be different factors. Fighting no, fighting's universal. Just it's beautiful. Fight. It's universal. You know, no matter where you go, no matter what country you went, you go to, fighting is, uh, it's like, a, you know, everybody enjoys a good punch. They see it, you know, they say, oh yeah, you know, that's that's a good one. You know, it's like, that doesn't matter where you're from. Well, you do when the guy who's being punched is a jerk, of course. Exactly. So. Yeah. They, they, they appreciate it. You know, it's like, so. <laughs> that that aspect is, is is fun, but it's the the if you talk to the real you know the guys that kind of can look deeper into this stuff, it, it's uh, interesting, uh, really interesting to talk to these people because perspectives that are not out there. Yeah, that would be cool. To That's a whole other show, Jess. Bring a whole someone other in. Show. Mm. <laughs> well, you know what? It's it's been good. We covered some good ground, and uh, it's uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Been a much pleasure. I hope I hope it was helpful for everybody. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I love, as I said, I love the concept of your club, and uh, I hope that uh, people give you a call to check it out. Let's give other details. It is called the Fight Club. You are the owner. You've been there for a while, kicking around, no pun intended. <laughs> um, people can look up your website, www.fight-club, not dash, hyphen, yeah, fight-club.ca triple w fight hyphen club dot ca wanted bill to say that without tripping over it uh and uh, tons of information on your site you have a, like a newsletter you send out free information mm. articles there's a blog there mm. and uh your introductory classes are dirt cheap and uh you are emmanuel emmanuel menelokakis i have to focus when i say that emmanuel menelokakis that is a mouthful <laughs> but not forgettable, not easily to be forgotten. You have a phone number too people can reach you on? Sure, 416-200-0200. Occasionally, there are listeners mm. who are not wired. 
416-200-0200. That is so easy to remember. 200 mm-hmm. 200 is the phone number to reach you if uh, people want to look you up. And anybody tuned in today who caught part of it, the whole show, but not the whole thing, it's going to be available on podcast as always, uh, switching over at some point tomorrow, Tuesday. Don't know what time, but it will switch over. And once it does, uh, you'll be able to catch it for about seven days on the CIUT website, www.ciut.fm. This program name is Being There. Just look for that on the schedule grid. And my name is Jessica Mendez. You can also find my email address there if you want to contact me make comments about the show. I can forward stuff to Emmanuel, that sort of thing. Thanks again for, Thank for joining me today. Uh, thanks to Susanna Lopez-Gonzalez for technical production and you the listener for tuning in. Have a great week.